Hare Krishna and welcome. I'm Kormadas and today I'm speaking to you from Sage Cottage in County Wicklow, the Republic of Ireland. And we're uh, again continuing on with our great transcendental adventure. We're reading the book cover to cover and today we're reading from chapter 4. This is the great transcendental adventure, the name of the chapter also part 2. And this begins in New Zealand in 1972, 50 years ago. The Great Transcendental Adventure Part 2, Auckland, 1972. Srila Prabhupada, in a letter to Brahmananda, wrote, In New Zealand, we shall very soon have our own temple. And that is exactly what happened. Tushta Krishna Das and his wife Krishna Tulsi Dasi were young and energetic American disciples of Srila Prabhupada. During their stay in Bombay in early January 1972, Tushta Krishna first conceived of the idea of opening an ISKCON center in New Zealand. The couple finding life in India very austere asked Srila Prabhupada's permission to go. Srila Prabhupada enthusiastically agreed and immediately gave them his blessings. He even intimated that he might visit Auckland after his Sydney visit. The couple wasted little time. They purchased a pair of marble Radha Krishna deities and set off for Auckland via Malaysia and Sydney. After a brief few days with Prabhupada in Sydney, Tushta Krishna flew to Auckland with Bhajana Bidas. Bhajana Bidas uh, joined me for his first initiations in Sydney in uh, May of 1971. Uh, he was originally from New Zealand, so now he's going back to New Zealand to help establish the first temple. Tusta Krishna's wife, Krishna Tulsi, planned to join them later. In only a fortnight, the two resourceful young men transformed a small house in the hilly, middle-class Auckland suburb of Mount Eden into New Zealand's first branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. They built an altar, they built a Vyasasan for Srila Prabhupada and printed a poster advertising Prabhupada's visit. Friday, 14th of April, 1972. Srila Prabhupada flew to Auckland alone. Due to a mix-up in ticketing and a cancelled flight, Prabhupada's secretary, servant and Sanskrit editor were temporarily stranded in Sydney. Krishna Tulsi and Jagatarini, who had both arrived in Auckland a few days before, had been busy making final arrangements for Srila Prabhupada's comfort which included the airport reception, transport to the temple, and cooking. A small band of devotees held a kirtan before the customs door, peering in as they opened, uh, trying to catch a glimpse of Srila Prabhupada, along with the initiated disciples, a group of Auckland's rock musicians who had recently become interested in Krishna consciousness were there, some in jeans, some in dhotis, and all with long hair. They chanted enthusiastically. Suddenly, Srila Prabhupada emerged wearing a long, thick yellow chrysanthemum garland that reached down to his knees. Attired in shiny saffron cloth, he carried his small white attaché case in one hand. To the devotees present, Srila Prabhupada looked wonderfully effulgent, almost childlike in his innocence. Smiling brightly, he appeared unfazed by the inconvenience of travelling alone. Prabhupada never travelled alone, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't affect him at all. Um, he was completely, as a devotee is, a pure devotee is, fully dependent on Krishna. So he travelled um, and he was completely detached from the situation, uh, unfazed at the inconvenience of travelling alone. After final formalities, Prabhupada walked with the blissful devotees to the waiting car, 
uh, not a limousine, but a pale blue, beaten up old Vauxhall Victor. Remember them. That belonged to one of the congregation. Srila Prabhupada had certainly been greeted by bigger and more formal receptions. With more opulence and more fanfare, Prabhupada, however, accepted the humble arrangements graciously. He immediately climbed into the front seat, which had been hastily padded with blankets to hide the ripped vinyl and exposed stuffing. As the car drove off, Prabhupada suddenly told Tusta Krishna to stop. Tapping on the window to Jagatarini, he gestured that she should get in the back, the back seat. Prabhupada was always very gracious, especially to his lady disciples. Prabhupada's mood was jovial. His entourage, he said, had been held up and were coming in a few hours' time. Srila Prabhupada looked around at the surrounding neighbourhood. He began to ask various questions about New Zealand and Tusta Krishna answered him to the best of his abilities. New Zealand, consisting of two large islands, lay 2,500 kilometres southeast of Australia in the South Pacific Ocean. The first inhabitants to arrive from Polynesia had called their new home Aitaroa, the land of the long white cloud. Today, its mild, pleasant climate and ample, lush pasture lands yielded cheap and bounteous dairy products, especially milk, cream, and world-class butter. Milk was 10 cents a litre in New Zealand at the time. 10 cents a litre. Creamy New Zealand milk. Auckland, situated on the upper part of the North Island, was the largest, the largest urban centre in New Zealand, supporting a population of a little less than 700,000 at the time. As the car drove through the quiet, green suburbs, Prabhupada asked about New Zealand people. Do they eat dogs, he said. Jagatarini remembered Prabhupada asking this very same question on his first arrival in Hong Kong. There she had answered, yes, Srila Prabhupada, these people do eat dogs. And Prabhupada could immediately judge the standard of the local population. No, Srila Prabhupada, replied Tusta Krishna, they don't eat dogs. Prabhupada smiled broadly. Oh, that's very nice, he said. And also, Srila Prabhupada, Tusta added from the driver's seat, there are no snakes in New Zealand. Prabhupada seemed very impressed. Oh, that's also very nice. And there's, there's still no snakes in New Zealand, actually, except maybe in the zoo. Srila Prabhupada continued to show an active interest for the remainder of the trip with Tusta Krishna, as far as possible, answering his inquiries. 155 Landscape Road, Mount Eden. A small burgundy-coloured prefabricated house now served as New Zealand's first Hare Krishna temple. Mount Eden was situated at the end of a lava flow from an old volcano. Auckland was cradled in a nest of 60 such volcanoes, and Landscape Road displayed an abundance of the characteristic large volcanic boulders of the area. In front of the little bungalow was a small wooden veranda and a tiny garden. The backyard was slightly bigger, with a revolving clothesline. Uh -huh. Actually, Australia and New Zealand both claim to be the inventors of the revolving clothes line. That's one of the uh, little competitions between those two countries out of quite a few. Um, and some citrus fruit trees. Prabhupada entered the newly transformed lounge that now served as the temple room. He sat on his large blue and red velvet Vyasa sun and he started a kirtan. Afterwards, he spoke to the 15 young boys and girls who now sat before him expressing his appreciation for their coming forward to spread the very important Krishna consciousness movement. New Zealand, Prabhupada predicted, would take the Krishna consciousness movement very seriously. And it did. The sister of Akshaya Nandadas, one of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, had provided various pieces of furniture and other items for Prabhupada's use during his stay in Auckland. 
This included clean white sheets which were spread across the floors of the small cottage. And according to the, uh, the standard in India, when you visited a, a high-class gentleman's house, they would everything would be spotlessly clean. They would have white sheets. The whole floor would be covered with white sheets. Often there was carpet underneath and there were white sheets on top, so it was very comfortable and spotlessly clean. And there were couches and chairs all covered with white sheets. So you felt like you wanted to sit down. Everything was spotless. And um, in order to duplicate that mood in Auckland, they did the same thing. And they also did that in Melbourne. Very, You feel very, very uh, clean and comfortable, as is, uh, as is appropriate. The uh, clean white sheets were spread all across the floors of the small cottage. Prabhupada stayed in the front room of the house. Auckland was experiencing chilly weather. And shortly after his arrival, Srila Prabhupada complained of the pinching cold in his room. He asked Tusta Krishna to seal all the windows with tape and Tusta complied. Despite the cold, Prabhupada reiterated that he liked New Zealand very much. You make some arrangement when the weather is warm, he told Tusta Krishna, then I will come here and stay for some time. I'll stay here and translate for months, he said. This is a very nice country. The people are nice, these young boys who are coming forward, they are also very, very nice. Yes, yeah, so this was April, and this is that. April is um, the cold season in uh, Down Under. The Auckland Town Hall was an, an ornate Victorian style building standing beside the square in the centre of the city. The smaller of its two halls, the concert chamber, had been booked as the venue for an evening lecture by Srila Prabhupada. Akshayananda's stepfather, Hector Robbie Robertson, had volunteered to drive Prabhupada to the hall. Early in the evening, the same quaint old car that had picked up Srila Prabhupada at the airport that morning coughed and spluttered to a halt outside the temple. Prabhupada, lightly dressed in dhoti, kurta and sweater, sat in the front seat next to Robbie while some disciples squeezed in the back. Prabhupada's mood was once again relaxed. At one stage, while discussing the plight of modern youth, Prabhupada, with a twinkle in his eye and a broad grin, turned to Robbie. I know how to handle these naughty boys, he said. Of course, that's an Australian accent. I, I, I can't do New Zealand accents very well. Um, the aged car pulled up at the town hall steps. Entering the hall... Prabhupada was satisfied to see a good-sized gathering. Posters, handbills, as well as notices in the local newspapers had attracted a broad spectrum of mainly young people uh, to the hall. Prabhupada passed large panels of decorative stained glass windows and mounted the large, solid, dark wood stage. Hanuman Prasad Goswami, who had joined Prabhupada for his New Zealand visit, opened the talk with a short preamble Introducing Srila Prabhupada as Krishna's representative, Prabhupada took this cue to speak about the Param Para system. Quote, Sriman Hanuman Prasad Goswami has spoken something about Krishna's representative. So, naturally, the question may be raised that how I became Krishna's representative. Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago. I am recently born, say, 76 years ago. How I became Krishna's representative? This question may be raised, but the answer is also there, ready. We have got a disciplic succession. Krishna to Brahma, from Brahma to Narada, Narada to Vyasa, from Vyasa to Madhvacharya, from Madhvacharya, so many in disciplic succession. Later, 500 years ago, Madhavendra Puri in the line of Madhvacharya, then his disciple Ishwara Puri, his disciple Lord Chaitanya. Uh, Lord Chaitanya, we consider him Krishna himself, but he also accepted a spiritual master, Ishwara Puri. Prabhupada described that the knowledge passed down through this disciplic succession is ex accepted as gospel truth, quote unquote. And that this was the system of understanding transcendental knowledge. 
as Veda Pramana, evidence from the Vedas. Prabha gave an analogy. In the law court, where two lawyers are arguing, if one lawyer quotes from the law book, the judgment is given in his favor because of his authorized presentation. Similarly, in the Vedic system, if one learned scholar presents Vedic evidence, his position is very strong. A Vedic statement is, is accepted in Indian spiritual society, said Srila Prabhupada. There are hundreds and thousands of men who are still dedicated. Practically the whole population of India is dedicated to spiritual life. Perhaps you may not know, but anyone who has taken birth in India has got a natural inheritance of spiritual life. Unfortunately, at the present moment, the leaders are under the wrong impression that India being too much spiritually inclined, its material advancement has been checked. Prabhupada explained that anyone could become a representative of Krishna, provided that he actually presented what Krishna says. In the name, should I say, in the same way that the postman becomes a bona fide representative of the postal department if he delivers one's letter without mishandling. A good example. Some friend has sent you a money order. Uh, he gives you the paper, you sign, and he pays you. But if he pilfers, then he is no longer a representative. He becomes a thief, a rogue. So, a representative of Krishna is also in the same way. If you present Krishna's words as it is, without pilfering, without any adulteration, then you become Krishna's representative. There is no difficulty. Unfortunately, Prabhupada explained, many so-called scholars, eager to show their erudition, try to present Bhagavad Gita from different angles of vision. Now, he said, there are over 600 different types of editions on Bhagavad Gita. All these 600 editions are studied from different angles of vision and they are all absurd and nonsense. It is very difficult. People have been misled by these so-called commentaries. There is no need of unnecessary commenting on certain things. Commentary or interpretation is required when things are not very clear. Then you can suggest the meaning may be like this. Very good point. Uh, Prabhupada gives a very interesting analogy here. Prabhupada's actually, his lecture here is quite technical. And, and um, uh, Prabhupada was able to, to choose his audience very carefully, uh, but he chose to speak in an erudite sort of way in order to present a point. And um, sometimes Prabhupada's lectures were very simple, sometimes more elaborate. Prabhupada gave a technical example, a Sanskrit, uh, an example from Sanskrit grammar. Gangayam Goshapali. Gangayam means on the Ganges. On the Ganges, there is a neighborhood which is known as Goshapali. So one may question that the river Ganges is water. How can there be a neighborhood on the water, which is known as Goshapali? How can there be a quarter or a neighborhood of human habitation on the river? You can question that. Gangayam Goshapali. Then the interpretation should be no, not on the Ganges. On the Ganges means on the banks of the Ganges. This interpretation is nice. When one cannot understand clearly, there is interpretation. But when the matter is already clear, just like sunlight, the sunlight, sunshine, it does it require your lamp? to show the sunshine. Sunlight is already so, so, so illuminous that everyone can understand this is sunlight. If someone brings a lamp, I will show you the sun, but the sun is already visible. Why your lamp is required? So these unauthorized commentators, they bring some lamp to show the sunlight of Bhagavad Gita. That is their business. Therefore, people have been misled. Good point. Prabhupada gave a contemporary example of the results of misinterpreting Krishna's words. He explained how the verse from Bhagavad Gita, always think of me, become my devotee and worship me, offer your obeisances to me, chapter 9 of Bhagavad Gita, 
had been foolishly misrepresented by a, quote, so-called big scholar. Prabhupada chose not to mention these persons' names generally in public events. I do not wish to utter his name, he said. He's a very big man, but now he's a living dead. Actually, he was the Prime Minister of India at the time, and he had been a great scholar. Because he had committed so many offences, now he is living, but he has lost his memory. He had developed uh, severe dementia, and he couldn't remember who he was. He was unable to speak, and he was in a wheelchair. Very recently, I went to see him. He cannot, and Prabhupada made a gesture. I don't know what the gesture was. He is like that. He was gesturing that this man was unable to move. Prabhupada partially raised his hand in a way just to indicate that the man could now not even move his limbs. So all his intelligence is finished. Nature is so strong that you can misinterpret, but one day he will make you forget everything. Brain paralysis. Heavy. Uh, Prabhupada concluded that the best and safest means of understanding Vedic knowledge is to simply accept it as Vedic injunction without argument. Just accept it. You are benefited. You save the time. Whatever is stated in the Vedas, if you accept, then you don't need to make research how to find out God or how to find out yourself. Everything is there simply if you accept it. Prabhupada brought the lecture to a close. So our becoming the representative of Krishna is not very difficult because we do not misinterpret the readings of Bhagavad Gita. We accept them as, as it is. There is. If there is some doubt, it may be due to my poor fund of knowledge that I cannot, that I cannot understand it, that we should admit. As we are representative of God, we are canvassing door to door. Please become Krishna conscious and make your life successful, that's all. Now it is up to you to take it or reject it. That is your business. Our business is to canvas. The representative goes to secure business door to door. Somebody purchases, somebody does not. So that is not the representative's concern. Similarly, our concern is that we shall dedicate our life to preach this Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Now it is up to you to accept it or not accept it. During question time, a young man asked whether taking to Krishna consciousness would guarantee getting a human birth in the next life. Prabhupada answered, yes. Even if one was not successful and fell down prematurely from the path of progressive spiritual life, still he would not be disadvantaged. A Krishna conscious person is guaranteed next life in a human form. That is also either in a very rich family or in a very pure family. Suchina means very pure family and Srimatam means Srimat, fortunate or rich. Shri means riches and Mat means one who possesses. So anyone who takes birth in a rich family, he should remember that Krishna has given me this chance that I have no material problems, so I have got enough time. So now let me chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And as far as pure families are concerned, um, as far as pure families are concerned, suppose one is born in a very nice Brahmana family, a Vaishnava family, he gets a chance immediately by his father's example and by his mother's example by his family tradition. So naturally he gets the chance, just like our children. These boys and girls who are married, they have got children. They are getting a chance from the very beginning. Prabhupada indicated tall, handsome Shamasundara sitting on the stage next to him, intently rocking back and forth as he listened to Prabhupada's lecture. Uh, this Shamasundara's daughter, Prabhupada said, Saraswati, she is a wonderful girl. She is a child, but she never goes outside of spiritual consciousness. 
she makes her arati. There were also many boys. Prabhupada referred to one boy, Dwarkadish Das. DDD, I call him. He's always engaged in making arati, in worshipping Jagannath. His father sent him some toys. But he did not take it. So I asked him, why are you not taking the toys? And he said, it's Maya. Prabhupada laughed. So you can train your children from the very beginning and make their life successful. That is the duty of a father and the duty of a mother. The Vedic injunction is that one should not become a father, one should not become a mother unless one can help the child from the immediate danger of death. Robbie uh, recalls, After the lecture, I discovered a parking ticket on the dashboard of the car. I later complained to the council that we had a dignitary on board. They waived the fine in recognition of Prabhupada's VIP status. That's probably the, uh, the difference between New Zealand and Australia at the time. Um, in Australia, they gave Prabhupada a parking ticket and um, they were relentless and they did not take it back. Whereas in New Zealand, they gave Prabhupada a parking ticket and, they, and the driver said, we've got a dignitary on board. And they said, oh, we're very sorry, sir. Yes, sure, we'll, we'll take it back. That's the difference. Uh, New Zealand are a little, little bit more respectful, at least at the time, uh, than the Aussies. Probably a little bit more high class in their behaviour. Um, Saturday, the 15th of April, 1972. Srila Prabhupada received a letter from Jadarani Dasi, his artist disciple in America along with an enclosed sketch for the proposed cover of the upcoming unpublished volume of the fourth canto, volume one of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The sketch showed Lord Vishnu sitting on the back of his eagle carrier, Garuda. In his eight arms, he held in a clockwise direction a conch, an arrow, a bow, a disc, a lotus, sword, shield, and club. Jadarani inquired whether the items were placed correctly. Prabhupada replied to her letter, confirming that they were. Jadarani also wondered how she should paint Lord Brahma. In Prabhupada's room in Auckland, devotees had mounted a framed poster of Lord Brahma flying in the sky seated on his carrier, as Krishna and his cowherd boyfriends enjoyed their lunch below. Prabhupada referred to that picture in his reply to Jadarani, quote, So far, Lord Brahma is concerned, paint him, paint him, just like you have painted already in the poster where he is flying on his swan for stealing Krishna's cowherd friends and cows. Hanuman Prasad Goswami spoke with Srila Prabhupada in his room about possible service opportunities now that he was a sannyasi. Srila Prabhupada, he consciously he submitted emotionally, um, Hanuman Prasad was a French-Canadian with a very strong accent. I won't try to imitate it. Srila Prabhupada, he submitted emotionally, I want to give my life and body to you. Prabhupada, smiling, reminded him, how can you give me your life? You have already given it to me. You would have to take it back. And that would uh, make you a cheater, he said. It was brought to Prabhupada's attention that one young boy who had received initiation less than a week before in Sydney had left the temple and disappeared only the day after Prabhupada's departure for New Zealand. That was Rajendra. Rajendra Das. I do remember him. Tall, lanky. Didn't last long. A couple of days. The Sydney devotees had been shocked and had asked that Srila Prabhupada be informed. Prabhupada's response was grave. As he did not accept me, Prabhupada said, I did not accept him. Phew, heavy. The Hindu community at, of Auckland regularly met at the Gandhi Hall in the inner city suburb of Ponsonby. Prabhupada was scheduled to speak there in the evening and address the mainly Gujarati crowd. He was well aware of the plight of modern-day Indians. They had abandoned, more or less, their own culture. Prabhupada had explained that this was due partly to foreign invasion into India 
and partly to India's leaders embracing Western materialism. But still, Prabhupada had once explained, if there is any civilization left anywhere, it is in India. Prabhupada had also once compared modern-day Indian civilization to a dead elephant. An elephant is such a valuable animal, he said, that even when dead, because of its bones and tusks and hide, it remains almost as valuable as when alive and working. Similarly, although Indian culture was practically dead, it still had great value. Most Indians in the villages still retained simple faith in and knowledge of subjects that were still unknown to even the most sophisticated and educated members of Western society. Good point. But it was clear that many of the Indians in New Zealand had abandoned their piety and taken to the cheap life of sense gratification. Indian immigrants, Prabhupada had said, were like new crows. When crows eat garbage, after a while they're full. But if a new crow arrives, he becomes especially eager. Mmm, garbage, ooh, yummy. Similarly, I added that bit, Prabhupada didn't give that example, but um, after a while they are full. But if a new crow arrives, he becomes especially eager. Similarly, uh, many Indians newly arrived in the West, were more eager for material advancement than the Westerners. Yet despite Prabhupada's criticism of Indians, wherever uh, or whenever he met anyone of Indian birth, he seemed especially sympathetic and friendly, although he would not compromise when it came to philosophical deviance. The program at Gandhi Hall particularly highlighted the confusion of Auckland's Indian community with a hodgepodge of philosophical misconceptions. As was usual for the hall, the reception was neither very formal nor very organised. Some of the audience spoke loudly to each other, unashamedly during the lectures, the lecture, while others appeared disinterested or even disrespectful. Hmm... Prabhupada chose to speak a long and forceful lecture on Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 1. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Maiya Shakta Manapata, Yogam Yunjan Madashraya, Asam Shayam Samagram Mam, Yata Gyasasi Tach Trinu. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Now hear, O son of Pritha, how, by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. Prabhupada spoke uncompromisingly, stressing again and again the supremacy of the personal feature, Bhagavan, following the Vedic theistic philosophy that the most complete understanding of the absolute truth is personal. This conclusion had been taught by the leading traditional acharyas of ancient India, such as Ramanuja Acharya and Madhva Acharya. He stressed that those who thought that the Supreme was nirakar, or formless, were flawed in their understanding. Prabhupada cited the Bhagavad Gita, stating that the impersonal Brahman was subordinate to Bhagavan and was an emanation from him, just as the sunshine is an emanation from the sun planet. Philosophically, Prabhupada was at odds with many members of the audience. Although the hall was regularly used for discussing Bhagavad Gita, the conclusions were invariably all grounded in impersonal thought. The audience were accustomed to hearing that the absolute truth and its impersonal feature was supreme. Prabhupada was well aware that many members of his audience believed that this impersonal presence of the absolute truth was the all in all, and that the personal uh, personality of Godhead was ultimately an illusion. Whereas Prabhupada's theistic philosophy accepted the individual self Atma, as an eternal servant of the supreme spiritual being Bhagavan, many who sat before him followed the teachings of Shankara, who accepted that the spiritual self was not an individual, but rather identical to God, supreme Brahman. Thus, their conclusion was that there was no need to worship God outside of one's self. 
Prabhupada pointed out the flaws in the so-called conception of niraka. You are so blunt, he said, your senses are so limited, imperfect, that you cannot imagine that a point can have length and breadth. But we get information from the Vedic literature, not only the point, but one ten thousandth part of a point is measured. Keshagra satabhagasya satada kalpitasya cha jiva bhagosa vigyaya because we have no imagination, we have no instrument, neither we have sufficient knowledge. What is the length and breadth of the form of the living entity? Therefore, the Vedic literature gives you an idea that you just try to imagine one ten thousandth part of a point, and that is the measurement of the spirit soul. I remember reading once uh, a devotee had calculated in uh, mathematical terms uh, um, that size, one ten thousandth part of a, uh, the tip of a hair. That is, if you take a tip of a hair and divide it a hundred and then divide it by another hundred, uh, that is the dimensions of uh, the soul. You take one of those one hundredth parts and you divide that one hundredth part in a hundred. That is... Uh, it's it's measured in microns. Uh, it's it's a huge, uh, it's a it's a vastly small uh, figure. That is the size of the soul. So living entities, spiritual sparks. That measurement is given in the Vedic literatures. Wherever there is measurement, there is form. But because we cannot see the form, we say nirakar. It is our incompetency. Just as we are living entities, he said. The Supreme is also a living entity. We are Brahman and Krishna is Parabrahman, Supreme Brahman, Nityo Nityanam, the chief of all eternals, Chaitanas Chaitananam. He is the supreme living entity of all living entities. He is also a living entity. So if I am a living entity, I have got form. So why the supreme living entity doesn't have a form? This is a, a poor fund of knowledge. God is not nirakar, but we cannot estimate his akar. That is nirakar. We cannot estimate how big he is. Nirakar does not mean formless. When there is in the Shastra the word nirakar, this word is used to mean that he has no prakrita akar. He has no material form. That is nirakar. Not that he has no form. That is poor fund of knowledge. He is sat Chit Ananda Vigraha. So Prabhupada was uncompromising and all all the guests were chatting and talking and distracted and and the kids were crying and the women were chatting and um, I've, I've been to some of those programs and Prabhupada was just relentless. Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Avajananti Mamudha Manusim Tanumashritam My original form is like a human being. And in the Bible, it is also said, man is made after the form of God. So God has a form, just like a human being, two hands, two legs, and he himself comes to show himself. That is Krishna. He is not niraka. Ishwara parama krishna sajidananda vigraha. Vigraha means form. Prabhupada spoke for a long time, citing and quoting many verses from the Shastra. In conclusion, though, he appealed to the cultural background of his audience. You come from India, he said. In our country, there are five big acharyas who practically control the Hindu society or the Vedic society. Shankara Acharya, Ramanuja Acharya, Madhva Acharya, Nimbarka, Vishnu Swami, and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we have, we have to follow the footprints, the footprints of the acharyas, the footsteps of the Acharyas. If you want to advance in knowledge, you must worship the Acharyas. Otherwise, what knowledge you will get? You cannot get manufacturing knowledge or getting knowledge from somebody who has manufactured knowledge. Whatever they are explaining, they are simply spoiling their time and others also. Big, big scholars, I do not wish to discuss, simply misled. Now this movement has begun to present Bhagavad Gita as it is and people are accepting. Srila Prabhupada entreated his listeners 
to accept and participate in the Krishna consciousness movement. So you Indians who are present here today, that is my request, that you can do tremendous service on behalf of your country. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Bharata Bhumite Manusya Janma Haila Jar Janma Sarataka Kari Kara Pada Upakara. So in this land, New Zealand, fortunately, you are there. You try to understand Bhagavad Gita as it is and preach it. People will take it. People will appreciate your contribution. Actually, I have appreciated wherever I go. When I was in Columbus, I met one gentleman on the street. So as soon as he understood that I'm from India, he said, Oh, India. India is very poverty stricken. Yes, this is our advertisement. And actually, in comparison to Western countries, we are poverty stricken. That's all right. But still, we have got a gift. We have to give something which is so brilliant. That is Krishna consciousness. So my request is that we are going to start a Radha Krishna temple here. So just cooperate with us. These foreigners are doing your business. It was your business to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. But you are sleeping. But the Americans, the Canadians, the Europeans, I'm training them. So you take it very seriously. You try to understand Bhagavad Gita as it is. Try to understand Krishna and spread it. That is my request. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada opened up for questions. A short, stocky Indian man asked a leading question. I would like to ask just one question, if you could enlighten me on that. <coughs> Excuse me. I would like to hear your explanation on how you have seen the form of God. If you have any enlightenment on this, in what form you have seen. Prabhupada did not wait for him to finish his question. Here, here is a picture of Krishna. You don't believe? You have not seen a picture of Krishna? Yes, I have. Then, why do you say there is no form of Krishna? When you see a photograph of a person, how do you know that he has no form? The man did not understand Prabhupada's question. Prabhupada repeated, If you see a photograph of your father, how do you say that he is impersonal, that he has no form? How do you conclude that? First of all, answer me. I have seen the form of Krishna. You have seen also the form of Krishna. There are hundreds and thousands of temples in India. Do you think they are all fools? And they have established by and they were established by bigger charyas like Ramanuja Charya, Madhvacharya, Vishnu Swami, and Lord Chaitanya. There is a Jagannath temple. Every day hundreds and thousands of people are going to see in Vrindavan. There are 5,000 temples of Krishna, 5,000, 10,000 people are going. You know in India, there are so many pilgrimages. So, do you think all these temples established by our predecessors, they are all fools? It wasn't clear whether the man had accepted Prabhupada's explanation. He asked, So therefore you conclude that when you become enlightened, you will see God in the form of human nature? Yes, that is after. But in the beginning, you have to accept this form. But when you make advancement, then you will always see. Premanjana churita bhakti velochanena santa sadaiva ridayeshu vilokayanti yam shama sundaram machincha gunasvarupam govindamadi purusham tamahang bhajami. First of all, you begin how to try to learn to love God. And when you are actually on the platform of love, prema, you will see God always in his form. He becomes revealed. You haven't got to try to see, but he will reveal. God cannot be understood by our challenging mood. Therefore, Krishna says, first of all, surrender. Then try to understand. Sarvadaman padijagya mame kam sharanam braja ahang twang sarvapape byo moksha isyami masuchaha. When you surrender, then you are free from the resultant action of sinful activities. Then you can appreciate God. Not that God is my order supplier. Please come, I will see you. No. Prabhupada answered the man's doubt at length and in conclusion told him, chant, chant Hare Krishna mantra with your tongue, take prasadam of Krishna, you will gradually develop your Krishna consciousness and you will understand what is God. 
That is the process. Srila Prabhupada invited him to the forthcoming temple inauguration and deity installation on the following Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. The remaining questions confirmed the audience's gross misconceptions of Vedic philosophy. One man suggested that as one becomes more advanced in spiritual life, the chanting would drop away as being less important. Prabhupada answers, Prabhupada's answer drew laughs from the devotees. No, no. Chanting is eternal. After you become perfect, you will chant more loudly. An argumentative guest brought the program to a close. I have one question, Swamiji. You accept Krishna as the supreme glory. Prabhupada clarified his point. I do not accept. The whole Vedas accept. The man stumbled on. But in our Hindu religion, there are gods and goddesses. There are so many. Yes, yes, said Srila Prabhupada. That is for material purposes. Those who are after material benefits, they can worship different demigods. That is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. That is the point. You're reading Bhagavad Gita. You should note all these things. Kama is taste hrita jnana. Yajanti anya devataha. Those who are bewildered or lost of intelligence, they go to worship other demigods. Um, so, those who are interested in spiritual salvation, they do not worship other demigods. But those who are interested in material profit, they can worship demigods. Just to have immediate result of material profit. The Vedas recommend, all right, you worship the demigod, that demigod, this demigod. So, our concern is that we don't want any material profit. We want Krishna. Therefore, we do not require to worship demigods. But the man was determined to argue at all costs. But why not Vishnu? Vishnu and Krishna is the same, said Srila Prabhupada. Vishnu and Krishna are the same. Krishna is Vishnu Tattva. Rama, said the man. Rama and Rama also, said Srila Prabhupada. We worship Ram. Uh, he is Vishnu Tattva. Finally, the man got out what he was really trying to say. Because they are the incarnation of Vishnu, the person himself is the reincarnation of Vishnu. Prabhupada was irritated by the man's foolish suggestion. That is your conclusion. But Krishna says, Mataparataram nanyat kinchidasti dananjaya ahang sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravartate. So if we believe Bhagavad Gita, then Krishna is the supreme. That's all. Prabhupada asked for Kirtan, and the program came to an end. Back in his room, Prabhupada relaxed, sipping hot milk. Prabhupada liked to drink very hot milk. Uh, in the West, we say piping hot. My mother used to use the term piping hot. It's a medieval term. Um, Prabhupada liked the term sipping hot. Sipping hot. In other words, when Prabhupada drank hot milk, he had it, the milk had to be so hot that you couldn't drink it uh, quickly. You had to sip, sip it because it was so hot. Prabhupada said that was very good for nourishing the ojas shakti in the brain. It would r raise the vital energies to the brain. So Prabhupada would take his milk uh, piping hot or sipping hot, and he would take it from a teaspoon from a metal cup and um, when the milk became cool enough to pick up the cup he wouldn't drink anymore he, he would only take what was so hot that you could hardly touch the cup that was Prabhupada's taste in hot milk Prabhupada relaxed sipping hot milk his adoring disciples sat peacefully before him he seemed pleased with the program you know he said with a smile I was like a lion he laughed and the devotees laughed with him. I was like a lion with that man. I would not tolerate his nonsense. I'm like a lion when I am preaching and I'm like a rose at home. This endeared him even more to his disciples. They were proud of Srila Prabhupada. His eyes were moist as he glanced affectionately at the various framed ISKCON press posters that adorned the walls. Lord Brahma coming to steal the cowherd boys, Radha and Krishna in the groves of Vrindavan, 
King Indra and the Surabi cow, and Gopal Krishna. Prabhupada looked at the young boys and girls before him. So, you want to be with Krishna, he said. You can play with Krishna, like this. He indicated with his hand the picture of Krishna taking lunch with his cowherd boyfriends. You can play with Krishna. You can go with Krishna. You can be with Krishna. Srila Prabhupada had once described such pictures as windows into the spiritual world. He spoke on, describing Krishna's various pastimes as depicted in the paintings. The devotees knew that this was a special time to be with Srila Prabhupada. The remembrance of these rare moments would stay with them and strengthen their resolve to become Krishna conscious. It was clear that Prabhupada was seeing more than they. But one thing was certain, while they were seeing paintings, Srila Prabhupada was personally seeing face to face the beautiful form of Krishna. Many of these recollections were given by uh, Jagatarini Devi Dasi. I was very fortunate to interview Jagatarini Devi Dasi. She had a wonderful, has a wonderful memory. And she was there in New Zealand and she was able to fill in all these wonderful details. Even the, the type of garland that Prabhupada was wearing when he alighted from the plane and this particular pastime. And of course the other, the lectures of course were all recorded. So uh, we were able to piece together a wonderful kaleidoscope of uh, events. And the next event, of course, was actually um, also recorded and it was made into a, uh, a publication. It was published in Back to Godhead magazine. An amazing lecture. Sunday the 16th of April 1972. The devotees had done well in arranging many excellent speaking engagements. In the afternoon, Srila Prabhupada spoke at the Barry Lett Gallery in downtown Auckland's Victoria Street West. I looked it up online the other day, actually, Barry Lett Gallery. It had been an extremely uh, famous art gallery in New Zealand. And it went on to stay an, a famous place for many, many decades after that, actually. The venue was a small art gallery made up of a number of rooms, one of which was set aside for a lecture. Robbie's son-in-law, Steve Thurston, picked up Srila Prabhupada in his car and drove him to the program. Steve was becoming interested in Krishna consciousness and took it as a great honour to do some personal service for his divine grace. By the time Srila Prabhupada arrived at the gallery, a crowd of about 50 people chiefly between the ages of 20 and 30, were seated cross-legged on the seagrass matting floor. Prabhupada sat on a small elevated seat topped with a gold lame cushion. The small room and closeness of Prabhupada to his audience made for an intimate, relaxed mood. Srila Prabhupada had chosen a particularly relevant topic for the day's lecture, Krishna, the Supreme Artist. Prabhupada described to the quiet and attentive crowd that despite the fact that the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna, was the supreme artist, he did not have to do anything personally. God is so great, he said, that he has nothing to do, no duties that he must perform. Natasya karyam karanam cha vidyate. Why? Parasya shakti vividaiva shriyate. His energies are multifarious. They are working automatically according to his desire. Shrabhaviki jnana bala kriya cha. Just like you are an artist. You are painting one picture, one flower, a very nice flower. You have, you have to take your brush, the color, the color and the palette. So many things. And you are taxing your brain how to make it beautiful. But you see one rose flower in the garden... Not only one rose flower, but millions of rose flowers. They're coming out very artistically painted. But when we are asked, the answer is, it is nature. But if we go deep into the matter, what is this nature? Nature means a working instrument, that's all. An energy, that is nature. There is energy or shakti, energy, power. Without power, how the rose flower is coming to a beautiful shape from the bud. 
There is power. That power is Krishna's power. But that is so subtle and working so nicely that overnight we see that a beautiful flower has come out. But there is working. There is a brain. But they are working so swiftly and subtly we cannot see how it is being done. Just like when we paint one picture, I can see, everyone can see that you are working. But this painting or this working of the actual rose flower, that is also being worked out by several energies. Don't think that, is, that it, it has come out automatically. No. Nothing comes out automatically. It is coming out of the energy of the Supreme Lord. But the energies are so subtle, so nice, so artistic, that all of a sudden you see a nice flower. Prabhupada pointed out that in today's electronic age, a scientist just has to push a button and his machine works perfectly. Or an airplane pilot uh, simply pushes a button and his huge machine flies in the sky. He drew a natural comparison. If we were possible, sorry, if it were possible for ordinary men of this world to work so wonderfully simply by pushing some buttons, how much greater must be God's ability to work? How much more fertile is God's brain because, uh, than that of the ordinary artist or scientist? Simply by his desire, let there be creation. Everything is immediately manifest. So it could be concluded that Krishna was the greatest artist. Prabhupada gave a graphic example of Krishna's limitless artistic ability. Krishna is the seed of all creation, he said. Bijang mang savabhuta nam. A banyan tree grows from a small seed. This small seed has so much potency that if you sow it in a fertile place and water it, one day it will become a big banyan tree. One should question what are the potencies and what are the artistic and scientific arrangements within that small tree that allows it to grow into a big banyan tree. Also on that banyan tree there were many thousands of fruits and within each fruit there were thousands of seeds and each seed contains a potency of another tree. Where is the scientist who can create in that way? Where is the artist within this material world who can create a work of art as pleasing as a banyan tree? These things should be inquired. It is called Atato Brahma Jigyasa. In the Vedanta Sutra, this is the first aphorism that in the human form of life, these inquiries must be made. These studies should be made. We could not manufacture a machine that automatically grew into a big banyan tree, Prabhupada explained. The conclusion should be that there is a scientific brain uh, behind nature. To simply say nature is working was not a sufficient explanation. We may become amazed when we see a small Sputnik in the sky flying towards the moon and we give all credit to the scientists. These scientists may challenge what is God. Science is everything. But, Prabhupada countered, if you have a cool brain, then you will see that now, in comparison to the Sputnik, there are millions and trillions of planets and stars, big, big planets, like the Sun planet, which is 1,400,000 times bigger than the Earth. Apart from that Sun planet, if we take this teeny planet, Earth planet, on which we are living, there were so many oceans, so many mountains, so many skyscraper buildings. But if you go above this planet a few thousand miles, oh, you will see it is just like a spot, this big planet. You will see that it appears just like a spot. Not only a spot, this one planet, but there were millions of planets. They are floating in the sky like swabs of cotton. So if we give so much credit to the artist who has manufactured this Sputnik, how much credit we shall give to the person who has manufactured this whole arrangement. This is Krishna consciousness to appreciate the greatest artist. Prabhupada concluded that if one actually wanted to become an artist, he should try to understand or try to be intimately associated with 
the greatest artist, Krishna. And for this purpose, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness had been established, wherein the members are trained to see in everything the display of Krishna's artistic sense. That is Krishna Consciousness. In everything, the devotees see the artistic hand of Krishna. Prabhupada encouraged the attentive crowd to also try to become devotees of Krishna and to become Krishna conscious. Then they would also see the artistic work of Krishna everywhere. Uh, a wonderful, as I said, a wonderful lecture. And this was um, made into a booklet later. In question time, a young lady spoke up. I'd like to know if His Divine Grace has a comment on the coming so-called revolution or the second coming that is being prophesied by various people for the past 50 odd years. Do you have any thought on this? Do you expect it? Tusta Krishna turned to the lady for clarification and asked, second coming of who? Uh, the second coming of either Christ or a total changeover in the evolution of this planet. Tusta Krishna smiled and indicated with a sweep of his hand, Srila Prabhupada and the devotees. Here he is, he said with a grin. All the devotees present laughed. Srila Prabhupada had not heard the exchange and asked Tusta, what is that? She asked whether you have any views that for the past 50 or 100 years people have been predicting that there will be like a, a second coming or a spiritual changeover which will have an effect on the whole planet. <coughs> Prabhupada nodded his head. So, that is being done now. The woman spoke up. There's a time, they say, in the late 1980s or the late 1990s, because this was the future then, that there is to be. Yes, said Srila Prabhupada, the signs are like that. People are taking this Krishna consciousness movement very rapidly all over the world. So it is not very astonishing if by 1980 the majority of the population chant Hare Krishna and dance. Prabhupada indicated Jagatarini, who was seated on the grass matting floor by his side. Her head slumped over desperately trying to stay awake. Now, here is a girl, my disciple. Her original name was Jan. Now she is a devotee and she was dancing in a different way. Now she is dancing in Krishna consciousness. She was a very reputed artist, you know, in Australia. Now she has given that up. She was earning hundreds and thousands of dollars, but she has given up everything. Now she is Jagat Tarini. She is delivering the world by dancing with Krishna consciousness. So that is quite possible. It is very simple. Therefore, there is every possibility. Param drishtva nivartate. Param drishtva. When one sees a better thing, he gives up the inferior thing. That is nature. So this Krishna consciousness movement is a better engagement in life. So as soon as one understands this philosophy, he gives up the lower engagement and comes to this Krishna consciousness. A young man wanted to know whether it was possible to know the source of Krishna. Prabhupada's succinct answer was crystal clear. Source of Krishna? Well, Krishna is the origin. Savakaranakaranam. We are trying to understand the source of Krishna because we have no other experience. We have no, only the experience that everything has got a source. You go on searching out, just like you are caused by your father. Your father is caused by his father. His father is caused... In this way, we go on researching, researching. Then you come all the way to Lord Brahma, the original person in this universe. Then Brahma is also caused by Gabo Dakshaya Vishnu. The Gabo Dakshaya Vishnu is caused by Karana Dakshaya Vishnu. The Karana Dakshai Vishnu is caused by Sankarsana. Sankarsana is caused by Narayana. Narayana is caused by Baladev. Baladev is caused by Krishna. Therefore, Krishna 
is the origin or the cause of everyone. He has no cause. He has no source. He is the original source of everything. Aham sarvasya prabhavo. I am the source of everything. And Brahma Samhita, sarva karana karanam. The cause of all causes. So the Supreme Lord is the cause of all causes. He is not caused by anyone. That is his, is his supremacy. He is not caused by anyone. That is God. During Prabhupada's stay in Auckland, it was his habit to regularly see anyone and everyone who came to his room. Practically any time of the day, whoever would come to his door, Prabhupada would gesture warmly and say, come on, indicating them to come and sit down, no matter whom he was speaking to at the time. His mood was always peaceful and relaxed. It seemed like he had time for everyone. After the engagement of the art gallery, all the devotees again crowded into Prabhupada's room. Jagatarini was feeling very uncomfortable for having slept through Prabhupada's lecture. Not long after the devotees had assembled in his room, Srila Prabhupada, his head tilting slightly to one side, turned to her. <laughs> turned to her. Jagatarini, he said, looking at her straight in the eye. What did you think of the lecture? <laughs> Jagatarini felt terrified. She wasn't sure whether or not Prabhupada was chastising, chastising her for sleeping. She studied Prabhupada's face for a brief moment, but she could not discern his intentions. It was very nice, she said. Much to Jagatarini's relief, Prabhupada agreed. Yes, yes, I think it was a very nice lecture. I explained to them how Krishna was the supreme artist. After summarizing the main points of the lecture, Prabhupada turned to Shama Sundara. This lecture should be published. I want this made into a book. Shama Sundara complied and later trans transcribed the tape recording of the lecture. And I'll read you one last exchange. In New Zealand, Monday the 17th of April 1972, plans were underway for the following day's deity installation and temple inauguration. Tusta Krishna called a press conference in the morning with the local media to draw their attention to the official opening of the first branch of the Krishna consciousness movement in New Zealand. At 10 a.m., Prabhupada's tiny room was full of press photographers armed with cameras and microphones. Srila Prabhupada sat holding a rose between his right thumb and forefinger. A reporter from New Zealand, the New Zealand Herald, asked most of the questions. Uh, why have you come here? What is your mission? What are you trying to teach? How will this benefit the New Zealand people? What is the difference between you and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi? What's the meaning of the mark on your forehead? He asked all of those questions. Um, Prabhupada patiently answered all of them. Then, still holding the rose delicately, delicately in his hand, he humbled, uh, humbly appealed to the reporter. Please, I have given you this information. Please do not misrepresent us. This is a very important movement. We have come here to help the people of New Zealand. The reporter was taken aback by Prabhupada's soft, genuine demeanor and agreed to his request. With that, Prabhupada handed the man the rose <coughs> and the conference was over. So we'll finish there on uh, Monday the 17th of April 1972 and we shall continue um, we will continue this wonderful description of Prabhupada in New Zealand Prabhupada described Australia and New Zealand as the uh, most southernmost part of this globe and Prabhupada was the transcendental globe trotter Prabhupada uh, traveled so many times around the globe in his advanced age to try to spread Krishna consciousness and that 
is the uh, subject matter of this book. So stay tuned for the next exciting episode of The Great Transcendental Adventure. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare.